We are live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Anais. I'm Rami. And I'm Gerald. And happy Halloween! Last week we agreed to read An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge by Ambrose Bierce, but it's Halloween. And listener Nick Ward recommended that we read something spooky. He recommended The Crowd by Ray Bradbury. Thanks, Nick. And by the way, we will still discuss An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. It will just post next week. All right. So, on to The Crowd, a spooky classic by Ray Bradbury. If you haven't read the story, there's a link in the show notes. Read the story, then come back. Spoilers ahead. The story starts with a car crash. A man called Mr. Spalner. Can you hear that? I'm going to wait until that cop car passes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Sorry about that, live listeners. Cool. Clean audio <clears throat> on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, and anywhere you get your podcast. All right. The story starts with a car crash. A man called Mr. Spalner has driven over the divider on the road and flipped his car. Within seconds, a crowd swarms around the car. They gawk and ask each other if he's dead. He does not die, and in the hospital, he fixates on the memory of his car tire spinning. The entire crowd gathered before his car tire stopped spinning on its own. Weird. The street had been empty. Where did they all come from? Leaving the hospital, he sees another car accident and notices that the same people that were at the site of his accident are now present for this new accident. Those who notice him quickly disappear. He tells his friend Morgan about the strange coincidence. Morgan is skeptical, but Spal Spalner can't let it go. Later, Spalner does some research and reveals to Morgan many photos of many different car accidents over the span of a decade at different sites. The same people, uh, the same people appear again and again at car accidents, wearing the same clothes, not having aged a day. Morgan, now convinced there's something weird going on, encourages Spawner to take this evidence to the police. This is spooky, but Morgan and Spawner both grope for some perverted, twisted, but logical explanation. Spawner drives carefully, but is nonetheless rammed in the side by a truck. In the moment it happens, he's how surprised it happens. The same crowd gathers around him. They're running footsteps like rain on asphalt in a storm. They suck the air around him, depriving him of breath, and move him under the guise of helping him, but kill him. Their eyes grow inverted and shiny. Spawner realizes now that he has become one of them. <laughs> Ooh, spooky. You know what's funny? <laughs> we moved an occurrence at Owl, at Owl Creek Bridge for a spooky story. In a way, occurs at Owl Creek Bridge is scarier because it's touching on the scariest thing for humans, which is your life is meaningless, you're going to die, and there's nothing at the end. So in a way, occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge is scarier, but this is more Halloween-type scary. Spooky. Yeah. So this is more like on theme with Halloween. The other one's more like on theme with things that actually keep you up at night. So... <laughs> 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 what did you guys think of the story overall? I liked it very much. Okay. I liked it as well. I think there are a few plot holes that I guess I'm, I will need help filling or you know clarification on. The end being one of them, I wasn't really sure, but I guess you know we can talk about all that stuff. Yeah, it's funny. So I read the story and then I watched, um, so Ray Bradbury had a TV show, the Ray Bradbury Theater, where they would do like short uh, videos of like some of his most famous stories. So there was an episode that was the crowd and Ray, Ray Bradbury would rewrite the story for the show as well. And it would like lead with him like, people ask me, where do I get all my ideas? And he's in like a writer's studio with creepy shit around him. <laughs> it's kind of like Twilight yeah. zone but it's his stories. And um, in the TV one, it's so in the okay so what you were saying rami the ending was very like the plot just was like blink and you'll miss it it was literally one line that's like these are ghosts there you go bye bye you know it was like very there it is whereas in the um in the tv show one it was almost too obvious um one of the guys who leaves literally walks away through a cemetery and then uh later when he's finding the pictures of different car accidents he has pictures of all the people he's seen dead in a morgue having died from car accidents like they blow their load way early in the tv show one <laughs> so it's funny mm, like funny. this one the plot twist is blinking you'll miss it the other one the plot twist is robbed like way too early they're just like ghosts <laughs> so i thought that was funny wow <laughs> yeah also yeah, the tv show one is like okay so the tv show one is in the 80s yeah. and everyone has mullets go ahead gerald oh Ah, that's scary in itself. <laughs> who they were, who they were, what they 
was um yeah it, it's it it is funny how how tv shows tend to lose some of the complexity of the word and um and the word is is a lot you can go into a lot more depth in the written word than than in a, a tv show I mm -hmm. so so who is the crowd so um gerald do you want to answer i feel like i've talked enough well um well the <sighs> Yeah, the, the crowd is a mix of people. The crowd is a mix of uh, people of genuine sort of bystanders who come and help. The crowd needs to be the undead or the or the or the, the ghostly ghostly apparitions, brutal life thing who who who's like willish they gather around accidents and and maybe they they I don't know maybe they're sort of welcoming want to welcome people in, into their light and looking in the pier that's not good um so um that's who i think the crowd is mm -hmm. so, and, uh, go ahead rami oh, I was, so and they have the, like on what basis do they decide because it seems like they they sort of have it planned out i mean according to mr spawner's like theory that they're they they in, either intentionally try to kill someone or by, by moving them when they're not supposed to move them or decide that that person should live. Yeah, that's I, never been Yeah, I don't think they try to kill, but certainly there's a suspicion with him, with Spolder, that that they want to kill him and get rid of the evidence that he's accumulating. There are these people that always appear around car accidents and the like. Mm -hmm. The sense that I got reading the story is that um, they all died in car accidents, and in the uh, made-for-TV version, that's exactly what it is. It's people who died in car accidents that then are fixated on car accidents. And I don't know how I got that sense from the written one, but I did. Like, everyone's like, oh, these people probably all died in car accidents, and that's what's happening here. Um, but there's sort of a line where he's talking about how uh there are people who actually like these creatures actually do want to kill people and move them under the guise of not having known better and th that's the line that i sort of fixated on because it's like that's something that real living people do so i wonder if there's some commentary here about the way that when there's a spectacle people are ghoulish in there to gawk and aren't actually helpful um mm. Mostly, I think it's just a spooky twist story. We read some Ray Bradbury on here before. Um, but there always is a little bit of uh, a tether to some commentary on human behavior, right? Hmm. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Trying to, I'm trying to find where he talks about that. Um, no, yeah, and he said, you know, you have the perfect alibi. That was towards the end. Yeah, exactly. The perfect alibi. There you can look up the word alibi. I'll find it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you didn't know it was dangerous to move a hurt man. You didn't mean to hurt him. One thing that was kind of creepy, too, was how they're sucking out the air around you. That was very supernatural and bizarre. Because I don't think it's a thing that can yeah, actually he, happen. He writes some, yeah, he writes some very weird stuff. And and and, and he has this way of, uh, of writing strange things that are sort of based in real life but sort of not based in real life and a light he takes something like that, which happens in real life but then creates a spooky story behind that as well and, and then when when he's, he's doing the research and, and looking at all these pictures and and then he has the final car accident as well then the sort of spookiness go ratchets up as well Mm, yeah yeah also gerald you're breaking up a bit and i think it's bandwidth because you're yeah, stuttering okay. yeah so if you want to take down your yeah, video, just, okay i'll yeah. um, turn off my, my video yeah it seems like it would be a story in tales from the crypt or 
What was the one you mentioned, Danny? Twilight Zone, but it's not quite Twilight, Twilight Zone, but it, yeah, Tales from the Crypt might be more apt. It's more like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, but to your point, know. Rami, how do they choose? It's like they were all around him, these judges and jurors with the faces he had seen before. And then later, um, to make certain the right ones live and the right ones die. It's not clear how they make that distinction, though it is clear that once he's onto them, they decide he must die. But, uh, but and, and then I guess in, in, in this world, when they claim your life, you then become one of them? Yeah, it looks like it. In the um, in the made for TV version, it's not Spalner who gets converted; it's Morgan. So Morgan and oh. Spalner. Oh, the, the made for TV version's wild because they don't go to the cops. Um, I think Morgan's like, "Oh, you should take this to the cops," and Spalner's like, "No, I'm not taking it to the cops. I'm gonna face them myself." And then <laughs> Spalner's like, "You could get killed." It's like, I don't care. Spalner's a tough guy. <laughs> in the '80s one, the TV version one. So he goes out to confront the ghosts, and the ghosts. Um, sort of create an accident that's very bizarre. Like, it's not clear how Morgan gets in a different car. There's two accidents. Spalner and Morgan get into an accident, but they all crowd around Morgan, and they move him, and they kill him, and then Spalner's seeing Morgan's dead body, and then um, behind him, there's Morgan as a ghost. So he sees two Morgans, Ghost Morgan and the other Morgan. Yeah, the, the the TV one is very TV. Um, like I said, this one's very blink if you miss it. There's the it's just um, Spalner saw it was too late. He read it in their faces. They knew. He tried to speak. A little bit got out. It looks like I'll be joining up with you. I guess I'll be a member of your group now. He closed his eyes and waited for the coroner. That was it. It was very quick. Yeah. So, but you said you liked it despite plot holes. So, were the plot holes what you mentioned, or was there other plot holes? Uh, no, I mean the the ending was a big one, and like the question I asked about who exactly are these people? Because I mean, it until you mentioned it in your summary, it didn't occur to me that these were ghostly apparitions. Obviously, you know, I didn't, you know, uh, and knowing. Ray Bradbury's previous work, I didn't expect it to be fully um, grounded in reality, but I just didn't know what to make of these people and and mm -hmm. what how how the story ended. Yeah, yeah. Gerald's checking his bed with yeah. Back. This is why everyone should listen to the edited version. Hey, Gerald. Hello. Okay. Yeah, we well. were just talking about um, how Rami was saying that he didn't 100% know whether or not it was ghost because the written one is very sort of quick. Like, it's not as, it doesn't beat you over the head the way the TV one does. And, um, uh, but I think it is for me it was clear that there were some sort of ghostly things one thing speaking of plot holes that I didn't quite understand is how the ghosts like he was like not surprised the truck accident happened how did they coordinate that like how can they drive like how did they smash into him how did they get this truck like it sounds like they wanted him dead and they made that accident happen mm. that was a little confusing and in the show there was no truck so speaking of things that were confusing and stuff, what did you guys think of the writing? Um, it was quite good. I, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was um, I thought it was quite simple, but it it was It what? You what broke was up that? a little. I was I said it was it was the driving the the writing so it 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 was very um uh pasty way I, I quite enjoyed that mm -hmm. it's funny to me there was something that was so very when 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 did this come out there's something like yeah 43 
there's something very much like of that era in the way that things were introduced, the transitions, right? Um, the transitions were what stood out for me. It was very like punchy in a way. Like it, it didn't, you know, it starts with Mr. Spawner put his hands over his face. Then the next big chunk is the car wheel spun in his mind for days. The Morgan part um, just starts with dialogue. I seem to have a penchant for accidents, he said in his office. Like it just whoop, cuts, 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 cuts. So that felt very like, almost like pre noirish to me, like how you just sort of get dropped into things. Um, and, and the dialogue with Morgan just felt very like, at first it felt clunky until I started listening to it in my mind, the way that I would picture people from the f men from the forties and fifties speaking. And then I'm like, this is very conversational of that time. Uh, and that made everything click into place for me. And it gave it a sort of different flavor. Like once I realized there was a style here that felt very just of that time, um, even the way that it's just very focused on the action that the character is doing. Spawner was out the door, Morgan after him, down the stairs. Like, those just like, boom, boom. Like, there's just like a very, yeah, it just felt like Spawner walked to the window. He was cold. He stood there. He looked at his watch. Like, those sort of things, you know? <laughs> yeah. Almost it like felt... it's written for um, a TV audience. Yeah, yeah. It, it did, even though they made a lot of changes when they did make it for a TV audience, um, it doesn't even start with the accident. It starts with um, Spawner leaving a party. He's in a cool car. Uh, he's very <laughs> cool in the 80s sh when the 80s show. His job is bizarre. There's like neon lights. He's like playing with a pink bulb. There's mannequins with limbs missing. I don't understand. He has like a work studio and he lives there. It's baffling. Their lights glow. He has a chair, it's like a stool that has like neon lights coiled around it that's glowing. Like the aesthetic of Spalner's life in the show makes no sense. <laughs> I think we lost Gerald. Oh. The the TV show is on YouTube. I might link to it in the show notes so that listeners can oh, um, yeah. watch it and they can hear what I'm talking about. You should watch it too. It's just like, why? Why is this his job? What? Because in the in the written one, he doesn't explain what the job is. It's just a desk. So you picture like a wooden desk in like a typical standard office, right? Like you're not picturing anything special. And then all of a sudden you see this show and it's like, I guess that technically is a desk, this folding metal thing. And there's bizarre contraptions on. It's almost like he's like a found object sculpture artist. It's very wow. bizarre. <laughs> this yeah. is very bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have much more to say. So this, I think this happened with the last Bradbury one too, where, you know, I actually don't think I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of the writing style. I just don't mind it because it gets me to the story and I like his ideas. I like his plots, which I think Ray Bradbury would be happy hearing because he, we've said this before on the show, he famously would talk about how a lot of nothing happens in short stories. He was, this was a few decades after this. He's like, nothing happens anymore. People don't make it, you know, they're plotless. And he was very um, frustrated by it. If I can find that quote. But. Um, anything else you guys want to add? Um, not really. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. What was the story we read of the woman who was chasing the man um, and held him at gunpoint the 548 by john yes. cheever yes the, the, the woman in red reminded me of her <laughs> let's see i'm trying to find that quote yeah i, I will, i'll just waste time trying to find the quote but mm-hmm he has a lot of quotes about like writing short stories, things like that. But yeah, he, he later in life, he got frustrated by, you know, something we talk about, which is when a story is more just like a character portrait, but nothing happens. Mm. He didn't like those. And you can see mm. here, a lot of stuff happens. And there actually isn't a really sharp character portrait. We don't know anything about Spawner. We don't know anything about Morgan. You know, I have no idea what Spawner does. I have no idea what motivates Spawner. I, you know, it's just, it doesn't matter. 
It's just a stand-in for some dude in a yeah. situation. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's true. It's it's all about the story, isn't it? All about the 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 key character of the, of the car accident and and him becoming one of them. It seems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in a different author's hands, even the ghost would have had more character to it. I'm thinking of Lincoln and the Bardo. I know it's a whole novel, but like those ghosts had a lot of personality, and there's a lot of authors who would have given the ghost's individual motives. And yeah. here it's just man with a wrinkled lip, woman with a mole on her chin. Spawner is even just like man who had who was in a car accident. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And didn't that happen when we read the Velt too? We didn't know really that much about the family. It was just that's the one where the boy and girl were playing in like a room that would it was like sci fi. They could like make it what they wanted it to be and they made it a savannah and then they ate their parents. They became lions and ate their parents or something like that. <laughs> the belt. Wow. Yeah. That's a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a while ago. Um, and there's another one where you don't really learn much about the character. So it's almost like Ray Bradbury maybe will find... I actually want to like look now for Ray Bradbury's story where he focuses on character and characterization because he doesn't really seem to if he can get away with it. <laughs> and yet it works. We liked it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very very plotty, um, but it, it's it's okay. It's a good story. Mm-hmm. It is yeah. It is a Halloween story. I'd say. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a good Halloween story, and it, you know it did its spooky thing. It had a spooky twist. Um, I think going back to what I was saying about the prose, because he doesn't spend too much time dwelling too much on how the characters feel or think about things other than Spalner here being like, how do they all get there before my tire stops spinning? Like, that was like the only real internalization we got with him. Um, comparing it to, we also read The Mask of um, the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe, where the prose was very like tense, very moody. A lot of it was just getting you in a spooky, frightened mood. And this one didn't do that. This one didn't take its time to make the reader feel scared like at no point was i frightened um or feeling tense so maybe that's a downside Mm. to focusing so much on plot like talking about craft maybe that's true yeah i'm sure you're right okay so should we rate it let's okay um i think i'm gonna give it a four and a half Mm-hmm. It was spooky, but almost in a pithy kind of way for me. Gerald? Um, a five. A what? <clears throat> a, a five. Five. I came in with a four, and I'm sticking with a four. Okay. So we have a bit of a staircase going on. (laughs) All right. So thanks for listening to our Halloween episode. Um, So there's no game today because next week we're going to read An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge by Ambrose Bierce. But before you go, crash into the comment section for this story at our website, literaryroadhouse.com, and leave your thoughts on the story. You can also join the crowd of listeners who return to every episode on Twitter at Lit Roadhouse or our Facebook group for fans, the Literary Roadhouse Readers. Hunt us wherever you like. If your supernatural hunger for literary discussion can't be satisfied with short stories alone, join the Literary Roadhouse Book Club, where we gawk and gossip over full fiction novels every month. This Friday, we're publishing a discussion of Manhattan Beach by Jennifer Egan. Well, now that we know we're surrounded by bookworm ger- ghosts, we need an exorcism. Help support our witch doctor professional fees and podcast expenses by making a contribution at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, share this podcast with a freckled boy who follows you everywhere you go. Until next time, read a good story. Mm.